So uh, I have chosen to talk about the, the chaining in general because uh, it's a topic on which I work the longest and uh, it's a kind of fairy tale. If you compare the situation of knowledge at the beginning and at the end, it's not the same universe. So, uh, let, so over, overview of the talk. Uh, so chaining is a method to bound stochastic processes, and it was invented by Kolmogorov, among so many other things. Uh, after working with that for 30 year, 40 years, we know that for many classes of stochastic processes, <coughs> if you use the correct version of chaining, then you get an optimal result. The negative point is that uh, there is no doubt that the proofs are correct, but they are still far too complicated. And the reason they are complicated is we miss some ingredient. So there is still work to be done on the, on the, on the topic uh, to simplify it, like Fedman would say, being able to explain it to your grandmother, which is not the case now. Uh, so example of quantity of interest which depend on time. Uh, the value of your favorite stock, uh, the temperature inside a nuclear reactor, or the level of the river which flows next to your, to your house. And uh, Laplace would argue that this is no randomness, it's all deterministic, but in practice, uh, it's, a, it's a fruitful way to model these things as a stochastic process. So we the stochastic process, which means we think of these, all these quantities at a given time being like a random variable. So we have a collection of random variables depending on time, and that's called the stochastic process. Uh, and uh, so here is a notation. Uh, you, know, you denote x, t, t belonging to a set which is called the index set. And in the natural example, the index set is a part of the real line. Now, you can consider many things about a stochastic process, but the, the quantity of interest is the maximum value the stochastic process can take. That's what I will talk about. And for example, in the, the three different examples, maximum is very important. If it's a temperature in your nuclear reactor, is it going to melt or not? If it's a level of the river, is the river going to come to my living room or not? And if it's a value of your favorite stock, if you give a sale order at a given price, you want that price to be chosen so that the stock will be, will, at some time, will be a little, over, <coughs> little bit over it, but not too much. So, Kolmogorov, uh, for example, studied processes so that uh, they are indexed by the unit interval, so that if you get any two values, the expected value of the difference, xs minus xt, to the alpha is less than some power of s minus t. The idea here is that there is things that are continuous in nature. So if you look at two times which are close to each other, then somehow the random corresponding random variable have to be close to each other. And this is a pretty obvious way to... Uh, to implement that. So this is in all in elementary probability book. You, you consider this example. Now, but when you do that, you run into the, the great difficulty is that your index set is a real number. And when your real set, your index is, is a real number, you are bound to want to use the structure of the real numbers. And you cannot resist that. And for some problems, like uh, when you make this condition here, it's completely natural to use the structure of real numbers, but in many cases, it is not. And uh, that conceptual difficulty uh, held back, probably, for an entire generation, the progress on stochastic processes. So. <clears throat> I was fortunate to be a student of Gustave Choquet, and uh, when I asked him advice on how to do research, he told me the very simple thing. Whenever you study a problem, always consider it in the most general situation where it makes sense. So I call that Choquet principle in his honor, and I used this principle with great efficiency. 
And uh, of course, the, the idea of that is that you are not tempted to use some information which in fact is not relevant. If it's not needed to ask the problem, it's not relevant. Uh, now you have to be, uh, not to be confused, huh? that doesn't mean that it is important to search for the maximum generality of your results. This is not always the way to, to go. So when you use Shockey principle, instead of thinking of the index set as a subset of the real line, you think it as an abstract set. And of course, you are going to have to use some structure on this abstract set, but the structure you will use are determined by the process, not by the fact that your index set is an, is an interval on the real line. So the goal will be to control the size of the supremum of the stochastic process. So that's, that's, a, that's the, a random variable itself, the maximum value I have over all uh, value of, the, of t. And uh, when you do that, you try to prove inequality. So when you try to prove inequality, uh, to remove technicality, the important case is where the index set is finite. So here's a fundamental example. Uh, you take n different random variables, which are identically distributed, and you assume that for a certain number a, the probability that each of them is bigger than a is 1 over n. Then it's the elementary probability that you find the supremum of the process is at least a with a probability close to 1, 1 minus 1 over e. Uh, so you have many small contributions which uh, pack together to ensure that the, pro the supremum is large even though each of the variables is not so large, not so often. So <coughs> when you see that, you see an, uh, it's obviously a quantity which will be relevant to the size of the tails of the random variable. The size of the tails, it's measured by the tail of a random variable is just the probability that it's large, the probability that it's larger than a certain value u. So that's a function of u, and when your random variable has good tail, it means this is a fast decreasing function of u. So <coughs> there, there are some trivial cases that you want to eliminate. It may happen that the supremum of your family of random variable is large because they are all large and maybe each equal to each other, but all large. So you, want to get, you don't want to, that situation. So what you do to get rid of that is you fix a distinguished point in the index set, and you control the difference xt minus xt0, and you take the supremum of a whole value of t. And of course, you, get, you can get the uh, minus xt sub 0 outside of the supremum. So, <coughs> Also, I'll make another simplification. I'll talk only on the case where the size of the supremum is correctly described by its expectation. Now, that's not the case for all random variables, but it's a case for the, the, the situation where the theory is successful, so I limit myself to that. And I will also consider only the case where all the random variables have zero expectation. Their average themselves is zero. So in that case, the size of the supremum, um, you <coughs> it's the expected value of the supremum of xt minus xt0, and you put the, this out of the supremum, and it has expectation 0, so which explains that the size of the supremum is correctly described by expectation of the supremum of the process. And that's a quantity I'm going to try to control. Now, you see from that formulation that uh, since you have these differences, this is, the, this is the size of the tails of that differences which matters. So it's a function given s and t. You want to know how, of, how often the difference xs minus st is large. So the idea of chaining is, is, is so elementary. Uh, you have a, a, a big set to understand, so you try to understand it, in, you can understand it progressively. You consider a sequence of approximation by small sets. And the first approximation is as simple as it can be. You approximate the anti-set by one point. Now you don't get much observation. 
much information this way, but uh, your successive approximation become larger and larger. And for each point and each n, you consider an approximation pi n of t in the nth set, so that you have a sequence of approximation of a point t. And uh, since your set is finite, then you can assume that for large n, the, uh, the approximation of the point will be the point itself. That's what this says. And uh, so given the point in T, you have a whole sequence of approximation. And this up sequence of approximation, it's a kind of, you think of it as a chain, a chain relating the point T to the, the distinguished point T0. That's where the name chainings come from. And the starting point of everything is this, inequality, this equality here, which is a triviality. It's a collapsing sum. So all the terms cancel except two of them, which are on the left. And uh, uh, the, consequ the consequence of that identity is now you have to work on these differences here. You have to work on these differences. So if you control each difference, so for each t and each n, you, con you control this difference. You see, you are in a situation that this is less than a certain number a n of t. Uh, then uh, you apply that bound to each term, and you find the difference x t minus x t zero is less than this sum. And when you take the supremum of a t, you have controlled the supremum here uh, at the supremum of a t uh, of these these sums. Now, why, why you gain something on that? Uh, it is simple, is the, uh, when you consider the differences here, there are not so many of them, because these two approximation here belongs to some finite set which are not so large. And uh, on the other hand, uh, since, uh, since pi n of t and pi n minus 1 of t are two approximation of t, they are not far from each other. So you don't have so many quantities, and they are not so large, each of them. So you will do the obvious thing is uh, you will choose the number a n of t so that uh, all these, uh, uh, so that the set where uh, there is one n and one t so that this ha happens is small, has a small probability. And how do you control the probability of this set? You, the most trivial way, by something that the computer scientists call the union bound. The probability of a union of set is less than the sum of the probability. And you use that for the sets where the exceptional sets where the differences are large. Now, of course, you, the question is why, when you use such trivial things, how can you ever get a sharp result? Of course, there is a secret to that, is when you use a trivial inequality, use it only in a case where it's almost an equality. That's where the subtlety lies, but uh, it, it's not so apparent uh, at first. So by, okay, by doing that, then we will ensure that with a probability close to one, all the differences are controlled, and then we control the supremum. So let me move to the most important classes of processes, which are Gaussian processes. And the reason Gaussian processes are so important is they are some of a universal limit of so many processes. So uh, there is no hope to understand anything unless you understand these processes. So that's why the theory really started there. So the Gaussian process means the, the family of uh, random variable is a, is a centered Gaussian. And uh, I always go into a specific representation of Gaussian processes because that's what I need for the sequel. So one way you can picture uh, what a Gaussian process is, you, look, you consider an independent sequence of standard random variable. Standard Gaussian random variable means their, their uh, standard deviation is one. And for a sequence of coefficient, you consider the a linear combination of these variables. Now, the sequence of coefficients has to be square summable so that the sum makes sense. So for any set of coefficients, you associate a Gaussian process. And, and it's well known since 1930 that all Gaussian process, in fact, arise this way. So this is a completely general situation. Now, you see here your index set, uh, even if for some other reason, it was a subset of a real line. This is not what matters. What matters is um, 
um, there is a natural distance on the set, on the index T, which is just a distance on L2, and which happens also to be related to probability uh, by being the standard deviation of Xs minus Xt. So when you think of thing, things that way, you see the obvious quantity you have to work with is a T with a distance on it, a metric space. Now, it was known for a long time that the structure of the metric space, T, of the index set with that distance, it did completely determines the value of the supremum of the process. This is called Slepian's lemma. But the sort of miracle of nature which happened there is that uh, you can find the quantity which can be expressed in purely term of the metric space. You can find something concrete. Uh, now, Gaussian process have a nice feature, they have nice tails. The tails, the, the, if you take the difference xs minus xt, the probability that it's larger than u, it decreases like e to the minus u square over the square of the distance. Now the e to the minus u square, you have to keep that in mind because the inverse function is a function square root of log, and you are going to see plenty of square root of logs later on for that reason. So let me uh, make look at things a little bit simpler, assuming that I start with a set of diameter t, which is just a matter of, of uh, uh, rescaling. So the, the way people were doing chaining for uh, a long time is to each approximating set, you take it as small as possible, as its cardinality as small as possible, with the property that every point in the space will be within distance 2 to the minus n of one approximating point. And uh, if you do that and you essentially copy Kolmogorov's proof, you get a very useful bound on the supremum of a Gaussian process, which is called Dodeless bound. And uh, it's, a, it's a sum of 2 to the minus n, and then you have this square root of log, square root of the log of the cardinality of the approximating sets. Uh, now, this bound is it's well known that it's not optimal in all cases, and it's, it's, it took a very long time to go beyond that bound. And th there is a really big advance is made by Xavier Fernick, who found a more efficient way to perform the chaining. The, the sad thing is that was technically very complicated and also very obscure what he was doing. Uh, it took me an enormous time to understand that. And the main people, main probabilists thought it was something exotic and useless, but that's not true. It's Fennick who made the big progress, you know, break behind uh, Dudley's bound. So it was formulated in some term of exotic object, which are called majorizing measure, for which I keep the name uh, as an homage to Fennick. So the way... Um, in fact, to, turn, to do the chaining uh, is a slightly different from uh, what I described before. Uh, after so many years, uh, it, it figured out that the right condition to impose on the approxima approximating set is to fix a cardinal. The cardinality of the nth approximating set should, not, should be less than 2 to the 2 to the n. Now, why you have a double exponential? Because somehow the idea of double exponential, it's a log of the cardinality, which is important, the order of the size of the, uh, of the log. And when you're a number, you want to know what's the order of its log, you compare it to the scale 2 to the 2 to the n. That's how this 2 to the 2 to the n occurs. So in that case, it, it's, in fact, it's very simple when you do that to find the following bound is that the expected value of the supremum of the process is less than the supremum of a t of a sum where now in uh, uh, each term, now you have the 2 to the n of a 2, which is square root of the log of the cardinality of tn, and then the distance of the point to the approximating set. And here, L is a universal constant. Now, I'm not somebody who cares about the best value, so I'm happy to know that it's a number which doesn't depend on anything else.
So when you, when you reach that quantity, of course, you have to set a definition. And I'm going to define the following characteristic of a metric space. Now, I need, it, I need the parameter alpha because I'll have several cases later. So I define this number, called, this functional called gamma, of, gamma alpha of a metric space and its distance. And it's the infimum of the supremum when t is in the set of this sum 2 to the n over alpha distance of t to, to t sub n. Now, the infimum here is over all possible of approximating shed, sets t sub n where, with the cardinality uh, as I want. And the reformulation on the previous bound on Gaussian process, it looks much, much simpler now. Huh? The expected value of the supremum is less than constant times gamma 2 of Td. And the <clears throat> now the first uh, result I proved, which made me very happy, was to prove that this inequality can be reversed. Now, which I call the majorizing measure theorem because it was expressed uh, that way at the time, 1985. Now, that means that if you choose the proper set T sub n, then in fact the bound you obtain is of the right order. You cannot, it's of the order of the supremum. So the chaining, if you do it in the optimal way, will absolutely, completely capture the situation. So you summarize that by saying that chaining explains the size of a Gaussian process. So in other words, you know, you know now that the Gaussian process has a certain size. Now you can construct a witness which will tell you explicitly now, following the witness, you have a proof that the size is what it is. Now, this is a sort of a miraculous theorem because uh, the expected value of the supremum is a probabilistic quantity. And then the gamma 2 of the metric space is an, it has nothing to do with probability. It's a feature of a pure metric space. And uh, even though we know in complete generality that these two quantities are, are the same size, it doesn't mean that we know how to compute them on concrete examples. Uh, exa even if you look at an, something as simple as it could be, an ellipsoid uh, in, in, a, in a Euclidean space, large dimension, it's absolutely non-trivial to compute the gamma 2 purely using geometry. Uh, and in fact, that's a step that people working on the problem couldn't pass. Uh, uh, and in my, the problem in my web page, uh, there is $1,000 problem where, which es essentially amounts to, for a specific class of function to compute what the quantity is, the, the gamma 2. Uh, now, after, uh, I, after I succeeded with the Gaussian process, of course, the obvious question, uh, see, uh, this is a miraculous result. When I proved it, uh, Gilles Pizier told me, you are very lucky. And it means that I was lucky that the universe is nice, that the problem can be solved. And once you meet a miracle, of course, we are greedy, we expect more miracles. So uh, I, I say, OK, let us hope that the universe is as simple as it can be. What, what could happen? So what's the next thing to look at? The next, the Gaussian process, I, I made them appear. The, a combination of uh, uh, independent Gaussian random variable. Let us replace the Gaussian random variable by something even simpler. Uh, and the simplest thing you can do are coin flipping. Random variable which takes are independent and take value one and minus one with probability one half. So you def let me define the Bernoulli process. Uh, if you take a set of coefficients, if you take any sequence of coefficient, then you can build a random variable by taking the linear combination of this coin flipping variable. And you can, if you take a family of coefficients, then it's a Bernoulli process. Now, the, these, uh, these uh, combinations, these random variables here, they have very good tails. This is expressed by a basic result, which is called the sub-Gaussian inequality, which says that the tail is better somehow than the corresponding tail for a Gaussian process. So since for the ch when you do the chaining, it's only the tail which matter, uh, the, uh, the, you have the same bound as you had for Gaussian process, the expected value of the supremum of the process is uh, less than gamma 2 of the, the index set. Now, the, the fun here 
Uh, okay, so let me insist that this bound here is based on cancellation of terms of opposite sign. Now, to really see that, you look at what happens when you take the sum of n coin flipping. You know, when you take the, the sum is uh, the plus and the minus, they almost cancel. So what the sub-Gaussian inequality tells you here that uh, the, 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 the plus and the minus, we do not cancel. They are of, only of the order of square root of n of the total number. Huh? So the reason the sum is small is because the, the term cancel. Okay, that, that there is something different happening here. You have another completely trivial bound on a, on a combination of signs is by saying the signs are plus one or minus one. So you can put absolute values inside the summation instead of putting outside, and you get a, a bound. And this bound is a completely different nature. So for a Bernoulli process, you have this completely trivial bound that the expectation of the supremum is less than the supremum of the sum of the absolute value of the coefficients. And of course now, the, when you have uh, these two bounds, you have to understand they have nothing to do with each other. So you can interpolate between them. Now, interpolating between them means, uh, suppose now you have two sets of coefficients, t sub 1 and t sub 2. Now you define their, their sum, the t sub 1 plus t sub 2, is just a set of all possible sum when you take one, one, uh, set, one coefficient in the first set and the other in the second set. And uh, now x sub t1 plus t2, this x t1 plus x t2, it's obvious on the formula. So you can uh, bound the process index by t1 plus t2. The process here you can buy in a trivial way that it has a sum of two terms. And the first term you will use the first bound, and the second term you will use the second bound, which are completely different. So, uh, of course, uh, everything goes well with the, the supremum. So, you find this general bound on Bernoulli processes, which has its infimum over all. Uh, here is something very tricky. All the way you can find your set of index as a subset of a sum. Huh? And, uh, okay, so that's pretty much uh, obvious bound. And, of course, the big question is, is this bound optimal? Can you essentially reverse that? So that's a problem on which I worked the longest in my life, and I couldn't solve it. And I, that's a problem for which I offered $5,000 of my own money, and which was the best investment I ever made. Um, so, this was proved by uh, Bednos and Latala, and they actually proved that given any set of coefficients, you can find a decomposition so that um, uh, the gamma 2, uh, okay, there is, uh, here should, sorry, here it should be T sub 1, gamma 2 of the T sub 1 is less than the, the expected value of this. And the sum of the absolute value of the coefficient in the second set is also controlled by what you want. Uh, that's a wonderful theorem. Uh, that's a one which uh, needs to be simplified. It's not, it's, it's no doubt that it is true, but it's just too complicated. So please, somebody simplify it before I die. I really like to see a proof. Uh, uh, <laughs> Now, the difficulty of that is that the decomposition is not unique and is not canonical in any way. So I could reformulate my problem of please simplify it. Uh, 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 okay, so, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, so the, the, the way, you, the way I, rephra I rephrase the bernoulli ladala theorem is to say that chaining explains all the cancellation. Now, there's a part of the process where there is no cancellation, so you, you cannot you have to use different methods. But all the, the, all the cancellation which ever happened in the process is completely taken into account by the chaining. That's what it says. And the, the challenge is, since this decomposition is not unique, please find an algorithmic proof of it. So I give you the set T and find a, a procedure which will explicitly construct the set T1 and T2. And the current proof is rather far from that. So, uh, now I pushed the, this problem uh, based on philosophical ground, because uh, Bernoulli processes, it's a sort of the simplest 
type of processors. And of course, nobody in probability ever saw these are important, but my own philosophy was that since it's the most important, more, the simpler situation, it must pay a big dividends if you understand it. So that was a philosophical bet, and the philosophical bet was 100% right, because uh, after this, uh, the, the, uh, Latala and uh, Bednar proved that, then in fact it turned out that solving that, you can solve all the other problems you want on, in, in the same line I'm describing on uh, stochastic process. And I will describe two of them. Uh, I'll describe one on empirical processes. Now, since I'm short of time, I will not talk about empirical processes. I'll go directly to the probabilistic problem. Consider, suppose you have a measured space with n independent random points uh, in this measured space, which are distributed like the basic probability. And you consider a class of function on that. And the problem is to to evaluate the expected value of the supremum of the class of function of all the sum, sum of the value of the function at your different random variables. So, of course, when you see that, you know, okay, a process to control a process, we have to understand the tails. So, what are the tails? Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, I simplify, I just take the case where all the function have uh, expected value zero. Huh? Uh, so what are the, the what are the tails of a, a sum of the f of xi? Now there is a, there are of course this has been studied a lot by, in statistics, and um, the notation we use is I'll denote by f sub two the norm in L two and f infinity the supremum norm, and the ben, Bernstein inequality 1924 it's tells you that the probability that the sum is bigger than u is less than exponential minus. But now you have two terms. You have the minimum of two terms. And one term is in, like in the Gaussian case, is u square over uh, n, which is a normalizing factor, times the square of the L2 norm. But you have another term, which is, u, which is just exponential. And uh, once you have a tail on the... When you have a bound on the tail, you go through the chaining machine and you get an upper bound. And now since in the, in the bound for the tail there are two terms, you expect that uh, it will be a little bit more complicated than in the Gaussian case. You have two terms in the bound. You have one term which in the, in the gamma 2 of the class of function looked at the metric space with the L2 distance, and one the gamma 1 which looked at the supremum distance. So that's... Uh, uh, that is it. But then, also for classes of function, you can use a, a bound which doesn't use cancellation. And the bound, which doesn't do, you, just, you have a sum, you just put absolute values. So the sum can be small because the sum of the absolute values is already small. Obviously, then there is no cancellation. So that gives you a second bound, and uh, when you have two bounds, you can interpolate between them. So interpolate between them, okay, that's complicated, but you know, it's exactly what I did before. Huh? You, your set of indexes, you decompose in function in two pieces. For one piece, you use the bound from chaining, and from the other piece, you use the bound for absolute values. And when you have a bound like that, then the $100 question is, can you reverse this bound? Is it optimal? So I modestly call that the fundamental theorem and empirical processes. Not everybody will agree. That the uh, previous inequality can be reversed. So given any class of function, I can decompose it in that way. And that means that Bernstein inequality explains all the possible cancellation there is in this sum. But if you think about that, it's something completely miraculous, which I don't fully understand, because uh, Bernstein inequality is one of many possible inequalities you have on these sums. And it happened that this one is sufficient to capture everything. Even though you have other inequality, which in other ranges are, are better, it's Bernstein inequality suffices. This is, this is sort of interesting. Uh, so the, philosophically, when you are in a cocktail party, you explain that chaining using Bernstein inequality explain all the cancellation. And then you show you understand something. <laughs> Uh, now, of course, there is no miracle. That the decomposition exists doesn't mean that it is easy to discover. So, in practice, what do we do with such a theorem? Well, um, 
Okay, I looked at some very non-trivial examples uh, of empirical processes which uh, had been studied before, and what, what would it how would it help me to know this before attacking them? And the sad thing is, uh, when you see uh, any kind of difficult theorem, the chaining arguments are very easy. The, all the work is for the rest. So that's really what it is only in practice. Now, the chaining, red chaining uses explain all the cancellation, but in practice, this means your chaining argument will be easy and all the work will be for the rest. It's no, no much gain, sadly. Um, now, last thing I'll talk are random Fourier series, because random Fourier series, that's probably the topic on which I work the longest. Uh, now, random Fourier series, if you state the problem on R, it's infinitely difficult because you want to use the structure of R. So if you want to make the problem easy, you put an abstract version of it. An abstract version of it, you consider a compact group, and in this group you consider a sequence of characters. And you consider independent symmetric random variables. So symmetric means they have the same law as their opposite. And the problem is of the convergence of random Fourier series, in which sense you ask when the, the random series Fi, Xi, I converges almost surely, that convergence is for the uniform convergence of the series on the space of continuous functions. Now, that's for some mysterious reason, this topic was popular at the time. Uh, there are results from Zygmunt, Palais, Kahan, and the last paper was Marcus and Pizier, who completely transformed the, the classical result, and they went much further. They went much further, but I was not totally satisfied. It, I didn't feel I completely understand, so all by myself, I worked a very, very long time on that. Um, and Marcus and Pizier proved a, a, a theorem which is spectacular, but in, in, in retrospect is not so difficult. When your coefficients are square integrable, you can define the distance on the group. Uh, the distance, the square of the distance, in the sum of you take the expectation of fi to the square, and you take the square of the difference of the uh, value of the, the characters. And they prove that if the gamma 2 of the group for this distance is finite, then the series converge almost surely, in the sense. But again, there is a trivial observation that if you take a sequence of number with the sum of the absolute value is finite, then the corresponding Fourier series converges trivially because the characters are bounded by one. So, so as a consequence of that, if you take a random, a, a random series of, uh, of random functions so, so that the, the sum is finite almost surely, then the corresponding Fourier series will converge almost surely. So you have two simple situations where the random Fourier converge almost surely. Now, I looked at that problem for 40 years before I dared making the conjecture that, in fact, this was the only possible case. And, uh, uh, I, and, and the miracle is that it is. The general case where a random Fourier theory converges almost surely, it's a mixture of the preceding cases. So I don't want to won't write it, was it a mixture? Uh, but its mixture is very well hidden. You cannot easily tell by looking at it that it's a mixture, but it always is. And it was not very difficult to prove, in fact. But it, it, such a theorem shouldn't be true. So I didn't dare conjecture it could be true. And that's among the last things I did. And as I said, I already had holes in my frontal lobes when I did that. So it must not be so very difficult. OK, thank you so much.